Is it working? Yeah. Okay. Great. Um, so thank you uh, for the opportunity to be here today. Um, I'd like to talk to you um, about our work on understanding and then optimizing um, solution processed uh, solids. So there's a lot of exciting work being done on developing new materials in the energy um, space for new um, materials for batteries, solar cells, LEDs, and thermoelectrics, but there's often poor, they're often poorly understood. So what we try to do... Is here? I feel like. Is this is this better now? Okay. Great. Um, so what we try to do is apply optical and electronic um, analytical tools to better understand how these materials are working, so that we can then develop better devices um, and hopefully also design better materials. So we work on two uh, application areas, one related to optoelectronic uh, materials and the other in electrochemistry related materials. So we have two lab spaces that we've built up um, in the past three years. And I have a great group of students working on these issues. Um, the work I'm going to tell you about today was done by my first three grad students, so Dennis Boisegate, Martin Ebner, and Alicia Yarema, along with three master's students, uh, Mihi, Sebastian, and Annalena. So I'll give examples of three um, different topics we've worked on. Uh, one is in um, using nanocrystal materials. So these are nanometer sized um, materials from two to 10 nanometers uh, in diameter um, for LED applications. We also can use these materials for the absorptive layers in solar cells. Um, and so these will be the first two examples. The third example I'll give is on trying to understand now moving up a size scale micron size materials and looking at how we can order these materials more effectively for lithium ion batteries. So the first group of materials that I'll be talking about are uh, colloidal nanocrystals, or I'll often interchangeably say quantum dot throughout the talk. And um, these are uh, typically 2, 6, 3, 5, group 4 semiconductor uh, cores um, that are 2 to 8 nanometers in diameter. And they can be overcoated with another semiconductor layer, which we refer to as the shell. Um, and to stabilize these in solution, so these are colloidal nanoparticles, you have um, ligands, which typically consist of a polar group that passivates the surface of the quantum dot, and then uh, the hydrocarbon chain uh, of different lengths that then allows you to uh, spend these nanocrystals in solution. So these are synthesized. Um, by injecting two metallo, um, organic precursors um, on heat, and you have a nucleation reaction that occurs, so these nanocrystal particles form and then grow. And you can change the size of your nanoparticles to, simply by allowing your synthesis uh, time to vary. Now what's very nice about this approach is with this synthesis technique, um, you achieve very high monodispersity nanocrystals. And this is particularly exciting for optical properties where you want high monodispersities to achieve narrow line widths. So because we're dealing with small uh, nano-sized objects, simply by changing their size, you change their optical properties. So with cadmium selenide, for example, by tuning um, your size from 2 to 10 nanometers, you can tune across the visible wavelengths for emission. Um, if you change the material set of the core for, to a smaller band gap semiconductor, such as lead sulfide, you can also get the same sort of tunability in the IR. Now, these materials have extremely high photoluminescent yields to, in solution of typically 90%, uh, percent, at least for these well-known material sets like cadmium selenide overcoated with zinc sulfide. So this makes them extremely attractive for lighting applications. So um, there are two sorts of uh, applications one could think about. One would be in the area of displays. And here you have um, emitters. Um, here, this is a, a CIE diagram. And monochromatic color is represented, um, would be a point along the edge of this horseshoe. And so the, um, the closer uh, your emitter is in its x and y coordinates to this outer circle, the narrower the line width. And if you then have emitters that are closer to this. The, if you have three of them, you can make all the color light that's in the triangle uh, represented by the three points here. So with quantum dot LEDs, you could technically achieve um, much broader range of color. 
uh, which is attractive for display manufacturers. In terms of uh, white lighting applications, you can imagine mixing many of these different quantum dots together um, from solution and having your emissive layer um, be a, a tunable uh, white light color and you could for in this way achieve very high um, color rendering indices. So one way to preserve the high quantum efficiency of um, quantum dot emitters is to embed them in polymers. Of course this makes them possible to inject charge into them but you can use them as optical down converters. So what this means is if you have an efficient blue source you can put then red or green quantum dot emitters in front of this source the, they will absorb the blue light and then re-emit green and red light. And this way you can either get um, RGB <coughs> pixels or you can get white light. And so this has actually been commercialized. Um, so you can now go out and buy um, a white light uh, backlit LED TV from Sony that incorporates quantum dots. So this is done um, with technology from the startup company QD Vision. And what they've done is um, they've replaced the standard white LEDs by um, efficient blue uh, gallium nitride based materials and then in front of this before the light gets into the light guiding plate um, and delivered to the LCD you have a capillary tube uh, that's filled with polymers um, embedded with quantum dots that are uh, red and green and so this gives you a white light then um, so the blue light excites the red and green quantum dots in this capillary tube and then you get a white light um, going through your light guiding plate. And this uh, more recently, so in the end of last year, you can also now 3M produces quantum dot sheets of polymer um, that are now used in the color Kindles. So this is uh, from the technology of the startup company Nanosys. And so this is a roll of polymer with quantum dots embedded in it. So this is a very exciting for us working in this field because we now see that quantum dots can be commercialized into large scale products. But the original goal and one of the interesting features of quantum dots would be to actually use them in similar ways to organic small molecules are used in OLED technologies. So actually directly injecting charge into the quantum dots and then having um, a pixels emit, not simply using them to generate white light through down conversion. But these are not yet commercialized, despite many, several decades of research on them to date. Um, and so for a while, for the past five years, what the focus has been on is studying the effects of charge and quantum dots. So if you have a quantum dot LED, you have a, typically a monolayer of quantum dots embedded between an electron and hole injection layer. And um, it's often extremely difficult to balance your rates of electron and hole injection into the quantum, LED, uh, quantum dot layer. So you can wind up with extra charge on your quantum dots. And this can lead to high rates of Auger non-radio free combination. And this was believed to be the limiting factor. So people found two solutions. One is to define better device architectures with better uh, balance uh, between your electron and hole injection. Um, this is quite costly to do and often takes away from the kind of large process solution based uh, methods you can use to put quantum dots down. Um, and instead, um, a major focus was placed on actually changing the chemistry of your quantum dot to design a band structure of your quantum dot that has reduced OJ. So this can be done in two ways. What was done is that you can move away from the standard core shell architecture where your electron and hole are tightly confined and go either to alloyed quantum dot materials where your core and shell are essentially blended together or you go to a giant um, shell structure which often has a smaller band gap shell material where you allow one of your carriers to be delocalized. And so both these have reduced confinement potentials and there's a very nice theoretical paper by Efros um, showing and uh, explaining why uh, this leads to reduced OJ. And this has also been seen experimentally. So these quantum dots were synthesized and now they've been placed in LEDs, but the efficiency is still quite low. So um, this led us to consider why uh, this is the case. And if you look at what else is, of course, present in a quantum dot LED, it's not just charge, but you also have an electric field. And this, these electric fields can actually be quite high. So in a typical quantum dot LED, you're looking at electric fields across your quantum dot layer of um, 1.5 to 3 mega uh, volts per centimeter. 
And so uh, what we did was we developed a device architecture that allows us to separate the effects of charge and field. So we place our quantum dots in a capacitive structure so we can, we're not able to inject charge into our quantum dot layer. We only have an electric field ac applied across it. And you have, uh, we have a picosecond pulse laser come in, optically excite the quantum dots, and we look at the luminescence uh, with a street camera as we apply different fields um, across our quantum dot. And so here what you see is the standard photoluminescent decay of your quantum dot luminescence. And as you apply um, an electric field, you see this luminescence decreases. So you see that summarized here as we go um, to higher and higher fields, the quantum yield um, decreases. And you see in this range of, um, uh, of interest for quantum dot LEDs, we're looking at over an order of magnitude decrease in our quantum yield. Now, if you look here, the curves actually don't change their shape, though. And what you can interpret this is, is that the lifetime is not changing significantly as a function of field. Now, because in this configuration, our quantum dots in this tightly packed solid have quantum yield substantially less than 50%, we can relate the quantum yield um, to the radiative rate times the lifetime, where the lifetime is basically entirely determined by the non-radiative rate. So that, this interpretation allows us to make the assumption that because our um, lifetime doesn't change with field, uh, what's changing with field that decreases our quantum yield is actually the radiative rate. And so we can explain why this occurs. Uh, we did tight binding simulations um, to look at the effect of field on our uh, optical matrix element, which can be related to the radiative rate. And what you see here is plotted in real space What's inside the dashed lines is the, um, the core material, and this outer region then is the entire quantum dot, so core and the shell. And in one of these um, uh, structures where you have the electron and hole tightly confined within the, uh, by the shell, when you apply an electric field, you get spatial separation of your electron and hole wave function, but your electron and hole wave functions don't extend into your shell. However, if you choose one of these delocalized uh, quantum dot uh, configurations, by applying an electric field, you completely delocalize your electron wave function into the shell. So this substantially reduces your electron and hole um, overlap, which has this dramatic impact on your radiative rate. So this here you can see the simulation results. Um, the colored lines indicate increasing um, cadmium sulfide shell thickness. And we did this now experimentally. We went and we synthesized quantum dots with varying thickness um, cadmium sulfide shells, and we see this dramatic increase, uh, decrease in the quantum yield um, as we see in our simulations. So what this means is that if we look at what we can do synthetically in terms of quantum dots um, to date, with LED applications in mind, we always want to passivate the surface of our quantum dot. So we don't want to just have a core, because there you have a lot of um, trap states um, which lead to high um, uh, non-radiative recombination due to trap states recombination. So you always want to passivate your um, quantum dot with a shell. And so you have two options. Either you, t you choose a shell with a wide band gap that tightly confines your wave functions or one that doesn't um, tightly confine them. So this configuration is very good in the case, as we just saw, for luminescence quenching, but it has high OJ. And um, if you now relax your con uh, exciton confinement, this is great for decreasing OJ, but now we saw that it's also bad for um, this field-induced luminescence quenching. And if you actually look back through literature at all the highest reported quantum dot LED efficiencies, you always see quantum dots that have some sort of multi-shell structure that basically would fit uh, between these two ends of the spectrum. So this pr uh, presents a fundamental trade-off to what we can do in terms of designing quantum dot band structure. Uh, for LED applications. And so what we are thinking about, um, one idea would be to use, go away from band edge emission to localized defect state emission within the quantum dots. And so you could imagine designing quantum dot ha that has low OJ non-radiative recombination, but then the exciton rapidly transfers to a defect state where it then is localized um, and will not be affected by the field. So we went ahead and synthesized um, alloyed materials with very low OJ non-radiative recombination rates and placed the manganese impurity dopant in it. And what you can see is this, these structures do indeed exhibit, uh, with the impurity dopant, do exhibit this decrease, uh, decreased field quenching. 
So this could be a strategy, one of the strategies where we could go with quantum dot engineering to remove the effect of this field quenching while still keeping our OJ uh, low. What's exciting about this is there's actually a whole class of materials that are just now being turned into quantum dot materials that exhibit localized defect state emission. And these are 136 compounds. And what's also nice about them is they don't uh, incorporate uh, cadmium or lead. Um, what's difficult, of course, is that to control the stoichiometry at the small size scale. And so one thing we did in our group was figure out um, that adding a lithium salt, which speeds up the nucleation reaction, can actually uh, lock your stoichiometry into place, so to say, so that you can change the size of your quantum dot, but keep the stoichiometry um, the same as you change it in these small sizes. So you can have um, very high photoluminescent efficiencies due to these small size scales um, in your materials. Um, and also um, see this uh, 1 over r squared dependence as we change the band gap that we expect in our luminescence. And these could be a strategy with this defect state based emission to reduce um, field luminescence quenching while still keeping OJ low. So another application area are nanocrystal based solar cells. And if you look at where nanocrystal solar cells lie on this chart of um, cell efficiencies, there this curve down here. So um, you might wonder why we work on nanocrystal based um, solar cells. So um, the, the end motivation is that nanocrystals could be a way to overcome the Shockley quasar limit. Um, so the, the Shockley quasar limit basically says if you have a single band gap absorber, you're going to have a maximum uh, efficiency of about 33%. Uh, percent. And these losses that you have come from re radiation of your solar cell, uh, recombination due to charge carriers, and also spectrum losses. So, of course, you need a, um, a band gap of a certain amount. You have to have photons um, greater than this band gap to absorb light. But then any photon with higher energy, the excess energy will simply be lost. And so um, this is a major issue, and this leads people to think about solutions such as tandem cells, where you have different um, uh, uh, band gap absorbers um, that then can successively absorb um, different parts of the spectrum. And quantum dots could be a potentially low-cost approach to achieving these. Um, quantum dots also exhibit multiple exciton generation, where with a, um, a single photon you can, uh, of twice the band gap, you can generate two um, electron hole pairs. And just in general, quantum dots have high absorption coefficients, so typically 10 to the fifth to 10 to the sixth inverse centimeters. So this makes them very attractive as optical absorbers, but getting charge out is still an open question um, in these material sets, and that's the reason for the, the low efficiencies that we have. So the state of the art currently is about 8 to 9 percent efficient, um, and this is really much too low for commercialization. But what's extremely exciting about the field is that we realize how much we don't understand about these systems. So um, when you have a quantum dot solar cell, you have a closed packed solid of, of nanocrystals that often on their surface are treated with some sort of, of ligand or linker molecule that um, helps this quantum dot solid keep its, its uh, form and stability um, when processed. And what we know is that depending on what molecule you choose to put around your quantum dots, you strongly influence the device performance. So with the same quantum dot, simply by changing the molecule, you can get um, an order of magnitude change in your efficiency. And this is linked to the presence of trap states. So of course, what you do to the surface of your quantum dot invariably influences the number of trap states you have on the surface. And um, it seems like we have quite a lot of flexibility in how we, we engineer our defect state densities in these solids in this way. But the problem is, um, for a long time, no one had quantified the number, what the band structure of quantum dots looked like. There was no knowledge of how many trap states you had per quantum dot or how these trap states couple and act as recombination centers in your solar cell. Um, so our goal um, in our group is really to try to quantify trap state densities and defect states uh, in these quantum dots and understand how to choose the linker molecule appropriately to get a specific charge transport property in these quantum dot solids. 
So just to explain how we actually go about making a quantum dot solar cell. So you start out with an indium tin oxide transparent uh, anode. Um, you dip this into your solution of quantum dots. Um, so now your quantum dots have these long chain ligands. They're typically oleate groups coming off um, the end. You then dip it into a subsequent solution, um, which contains a, a nunner molecule. For example, ethane dithiol is a popular one. Um, you tend to uh, remove oleate groups and replace them with ethane um, dithiol um, ligands. And then you rinse off additional ligands and you repeat this step typically 30 to 100 times to build up monolayer by monolayer your quantum dot solid, which ends up being about 150 to 200 nanometers thick and then you thermally evaporate your top contacts. So, this is just a very simple device that you can make. It's a, essentially um, a metal semiconductor metal um, diode. And um, what we can now do is apply a variety of techniques that have been around since the 1970s for studying defect state densities in, in silicon and 2,6 and organic materials, but had not yet been applied to nanocrystal solids. So we apply two techniques um, that are basically purely electronic in nature. So one is a capacitive-based technique of thermal admittance spectroscopy. The other is a transient technique, um, deep level transient spectroscopy. And um, we can then um, uh, uh, calculate the number um, density of traps as a function of energy uh, in the mid gap region. And what you see is here in dashed lines the results from the thermal admittance spectroscopy, and in the shaded region, what we achieve from the DLTS measurements. And they very nicely agree and show the presence of uh, a trap manifold. Um, at about uh, 0.36 eV below the conduction band with a density of 10 to the 17th. We then also implement a optoelectronic technique, so Fourier transform photocurrent spectroscopy. And again, we see this distinct trap state. And actually, both these measurements are um, in agreement because what we, we see here is we're probing through these electronic spectroscopy techniques this, um, the distance between the trap states and our conduction band, and this 0.67 eV corresponds the distance between our valence band and our trap state band here. So these are the first measurements of trap state densities um, in, in quantum dot uh, based devices, and they allow us also, these electronic techniques allow us to calculate what's known as the attempt frequency, which is the coupling rate between the trap states and the quantum dots. So we also are able to um, extract these values. And from these measurements, we're actually able to build up a picture of band structure in these materials and then understand why we, the electronic properties um, we see um, are present. So one thing um, that's known is that quantum dot devices tend to age if they're just left out in air. Um, and we see a change um, that's characterized typically by a change in short circuit current from the day they were first made um, to um, say day two when they're just left out um, on the shelf. And um, so we apply these techniques that I just described to these two different devices. And what we see is that the shift um, due to, uh, in current density is actually not due to a change in trap state density as been kind of suspected and hypothesized in literature, but it's actually just simply due to a shift in your Fermi level in your device. And because we're dealing with such um, high densities of trap states in these materials, we're actually looking at Fermi level pinning. So we have so many trap states that our Fermi level is essentially pinned by um, the trap states. And so these are the sort of exciting things that we can understand from these techniques um, that are not, um, um, that hopefully will help us guide next generation solar cell design using these new materials. So now is the third example. Um, I'll switch to, to batteries. So in a lithium ion battery, um, you have um, two electrodes, the anode and the cathode, and these are the, the parts of your battery which contain your electrochemically active material. And so during discharge of your battery, um, when it's powering, say, a computer that's not hooked up uh, to the wall, right, you have um, lithium ions uh, leave um, the, uh, the anode and traverse the separator, which is an electronic uh, insulator, but is ionically conductive, so it's a porous uh, membrane that allows your lithium to move through the electrolyte to the cathode. Um, and this um, 
release of the lithium ion from the anode material um, also contributes to an electron uh, current um, that powers your device. So um, the challenges um, that, of course, batteries face are that the energy densities are, are lower than we'd like, their lifetimes are shorter than we'd like, and their uh, safety issues. And so there are two sort of approaches to trying to address these challenges. One is in bringing in new materials. So the major idea is to replace intercalation compounds, um, which are examples like graphite, for example, where lithium moves into free lattice spaces in your crystal structure. Um, these also intercalation compounds also are the major transition metal oxides, like lithium cobalt oxide, which was in the first Sony batteries. And you can replace these materials with other materials known as conversion materials. These typically have um, capacities that are about a factor of 10 larger um, than intercalation materials. And they consist of uh, metals and their oxides, nitrides, and phosphides. So this is um, exciting, but as we're going to see, these materials um, exhibit a large amount of degradation during operation, which at this point is, is not well understood or controlled. And so one of our techniques will be uh, focused on trying to understand exactly how lithiation occurs in these materials and how we can design conversion materials to avoid this degradation. The other approach that one could take um, in looking at next generation batteries is to also improve the microstructure. So to take the same materials that we use today, but to now try to structure them um, in the way they are arranged in the anode and cathode more intelligently. And in this way, um, the major parameter here that we'll discuss is tortuosity, which is, can be thought of as an effective path length for lithium transport through your anode or cathode. Now, the problem in general with this approach is that most ways of structuring materials are quite costly. So one of the challenges here is to look for next generation manufacturing approaches that are actually industrial compatible and low enough cost to be of relevance to the battery industry. So one technique that we can apply to understand microstructure in lithium ion batteries and new materials is um, X-ray tomography. So in X-ray tomography, you have um, monochromatic X-rays from a synchrotron source that impinge on your battery sample. They're partially attenuated um, due to absorption um, in the battery material. And then these partially attenuated X-rays strike a scintillator where they're converted to visible light, which then can be imaged uh, with a CMOS camera. So your battery uh, sample is rotated through 180 degrees, and projection images are taken every fraction of a degree. And then um, you, what you end up getting is a stack of two-dimensional absorption maps arranged at different heights throughout your sample. And one of the first things we did was wrote code to um, identify and label, so to take this two-dimensional stack of images and make a three-dimensional rendering of our image where we can identify and label um, individual particles. So in a, we're using a synchrotron, so we have a high photon flux. We also have uh, fast detection. And so each measurement that we take is about five minutes. So this allows us also to look at battery materials in situ, which is of high relevance to this degradation issue. So we can actually watch how materials um, and electrodes degrade. And so this is an example where we look at tin oxide, which is one of these uh, conversion materials. It's kind of considered a model conversion material because of the extensive amount of work that's been done on it. And so here's a movie showing um, a tin oxide electrode um, during lithiation and delithiation. So you can see that as you lithiate the material, you have this tremendous volume expansion of the material, and then during delithiation, the subsequent contraction. So we can actually quantify this. So the volume expansion of the particles that you just saw are these gray circles here, so during lithiation and then their contraction during delithiation. Um, we can see that actually this material goes through all the expected phases of um, lithiation that we expect. Um, however, um, what we see, um, so and in addition to this, what we see is not only do the particles expand, but also um, the electrode is expanding. That's what you saw by the increase um, of the front um, of that in that movie. So that's the whole electrode itself is expanding and then contracting. 
And what we can do is try to understand um, how the battery is actually breaking down. Because what you see here, uh, is shaded in, in yellow, is actually when the electrochemistry starts to go awry. So our system stops behaving the way it should. And by looking at not only how much the individual particles are expanding and how much the electrode is expanding, is what we can explain with this data is that as the particles expand, they extend uh, and expand the electrode. But then as it, they contract, the particles start to lose electrical conductivity with the polymer carbon black matrix. And so we can actually quantify how much of our battery is lost by simple electrical deconnectivity from our matrix. And it's about 37%, which corresponds exactly to the amount of capacity loss that we see electrochemically in our system. So um, this is a way where we can actually observe in situ exactly what the degradation mechanism is. And here it's related to actually the fact that a polymer binder used in this electrolyte was not able to move with um, the expansion and contraction of the materials. It's actually not due to the material capacity loss itself, for example, or fracture. So fracture does occur in these materials. And what we can do is try to understand the origins of where these cracks and fracture forms. And so in the material we chose, we chose tetragonal tin oxide. And what you see is there are very distinct um, grain boundaries in this material along the 100 uh, plane. So you can see that in this FIV um, tomographic cross section here. This is a zoom in image. And we can watch and see that actually crack formation happens preferentially along these grain boundaries. So for example, in this particle here, you see that during delithiation, uh, you get this crack formation um, along these grain boundaries. And it happens in all the particles. They're just randomly oriented in your electrode. So this video just highlights in that particular particle. And this really drives the motivation and shows us that it actually makes sense to start working on amorphous um, or nanocrystalline materials because it's often very expensive to make perfect crystals. And so as a long term, to be able to, uh, if you want to eliminate fracture, it could be a, a reasonable strategy to move towards amorphous or um, nanocrystalline materials where you don't have these grain boundaries along which the fracture can occur. Now the other thing um, that's quantitative about tomography is also we can extract chemical composition of the materials because we can link, um, what we're looking at is absorption of x-rays essentially. And so we can um, look at uh, here, what you see is the attenuation coefficient. And um, so we see, as we expect, that we start out with tin oxide, and then we go through these different phases of tin oxide as it lithiates and delithiates. So this is the ensemble data. So this is this, the spread in this histogram represents all the different particles and the different states, um, chemical states they're at at any given time. But we also have single particle resolution. So what we can look at is actually how this um, lithiation is happening um, at the particle level. And what you see is it's a core shell process. So the green, um, it represents the lithia, uh, formation of the lithium matrix, which happens from the edge of the particle inward. And you can also look at differences between particles. So what we see by comparing these two particles, which this one is still lithiated, uh, lithiating while this one's already lithiated, this represents a particle that's in the middle of the distribution, whereas this one represents one that lags the distribution. So this presents a technique where we can start studying differences in particle morphology and how that impacts lithiation uh, dynamics within um, this, the battery electrode. Now, moving away from the, the operendo work, we can also learn a tremendous amount about battery structure in, a different, in addition to just the materials that are in there. Um, so one very important phenomenon I mentioned in terms of rate performance of your batteries is tortuosity. And so tortuosity, as I mentioned, can be thought of as simply this um, um, effective path length that your lithium ion has to take versus the shortest path length through. So if you had a simple, straight, open pour in your structure, um, a perfect cylinder, your tortuosity um, would be one. Um, but of course, in, in practical applications, it's much higher than this. And so what we do is we, get mic we take commercial batteries and we make batteries ourselves in our lab. And uh, we image them using the x-ray tomographic technique. 
I mentioned, we get these 3D microstructural representations. Then we run numerical diffusion simulations on them in collaboration with the group of Edwin Garcia at Purdue University. And in this way, we can look at anisotropic tortuosity. So that, by that, I mean not only tortuosity in the through plane direction. This is represented in blue on these curves. This is the direction that's actually important for lithium ion battery operation, because this is the direction your lithium ions have to move in to um, penetrate in deep into your electrode um, during lithiation and delithiation. Um, but we can also look at tortuosity in the in-plane direction, so in X and, and Y. Um, and this is the red and purple curve shown here. And um, what we did is we went and manufactured 50 different um, battery samples that were prepared in different ways using different parameters that are common in industry to assess what has the most important role on tortuosity. And what we see is that particle shape plays the most important role. So with spherical um, materials, what you see is that um, you have um, uh, tortuosities in all directions that are approximately uh, the same and lie quite close to this black line, which is the theoretical uh, minimum for spherical particles for tortuosity in a porous structure. Now, as you move to ellipsoidal materials, what you see is that your through-plane tortuosity starts to move uh, increase compared to your in-plane tortuosity. And when you move to an extremely anisotropic material like graphite, what you see is you have a tremendous increase in your through-plane tortuosity. And so what this uh, data shows, and now this, just to understand, these are represent over eight terabytes of data that we've now, we've taken out information from 48 different electrodes and plotted it here. So this is um, very, um, a large amount of data, um, so, and that has a significant amount. So we're looking at relatively large volumes, typically a millimeter cubed of area, which is about 100,000 particles per sample. So this is relatively statis statistically significant. And what we can learn from this is that anisotropic particles really drive um, anisotropic electrode tortuosity. So this increase in this three-plane tortuosity. Now, the reason for this, um, we can look, we can, since we can label and identify every particle in our structure, uh, we can figure out how it's oriented. So what you see here is for this lithium cobalt oxide that's an elliptical in shape, you can see that during the manufacturing process, it aligns um, that this elevation angle is centered around zero, which means that the particles are aligned parallel to the current collector, right? And um, this happens this also in graphite, so that the platelets align parallel to the current collector. And this is why you have these large increases in your tortuosity, because now you have to go around the particles to bring lithium deep into the structure. We can understand how, why this occurs when we think about battery manufacturing processes. So batteries are manufactured by mixing together um, the active particles, the carbon black and polymer additives in a process solvent, which is typically slot coated um, and dried onto the current collector. And then you have uh, typically pressure is applied to increase um, the density, so to decrease porosity in your material. And what it turns out is that this alignment process step actually happens uh, between the slurry coating and the drying process. And actually, surprisingly, calendaring does not have a significant effect on the increase of anisotropic tortuosity, um, as well as carbon black and polymer additives. So it's really just the shape of the materials, and if they're anisotropic, they can align due to gravity. So what this uh, means is that industry um, should really focus on spherical particles um, if they're going to continue to use standard um, manufacturing um, techniques. Now, what you might have also noticed about this data is that all the data points tend to fall along these, these, these curves, um, which are actually related uh, to the porosity of the material by, this, um, by the porosity to some factor. And um, this is what's known as the, the generalized Brueggemann equation. So the factor um, alpha here is the Brueggemann uh, factor. And um, what this is very nice is this showed that actually uh, the Brueggemann relation is applicable to lithium ion batteries. So this is something we didn't know before we had all this data. And the generalized Brueggemann relation is actually um, simply um, uh, 
a, an example of the differential effective medium approximation, right? And um, in the differential effective medium approximation, it's a way of um, essentially determining your alpha parameter. So you can take um, some knowledge about the shape of a random uh, powder of material and predict how this powder will, what the torosity of this powder uh, will be uh, based on this. And so what we show is we do these calculations. So this is a simple analytical expression, which you can discretize. And so we go through, and just by taking SEMs of our powders that we start with before we process them into an electrode, uh, we can look at different shape criteria um, and predict what the tortuosity should be. So we do this for the spherical particles, the elliptical particles, and the platelet-shaped particles, and then we compare that to what we found um, from our uh, tomography data, and you can see there's extremely good agreement. Um, so what does this mean? It means that um, because now we see that Brueggemann um, equations are valid for batteries, you actually don't need to go to a synchrotron and start measuring um, you know, running, uh, taking microstructural data and running numerical diffusion simulations. Um, if you're using standard battery manufacturing, as a company, you can go and take an SEM image of your, your powder, um, look at your major and minor axes of your material, look at your particle size distribution, and very, very accurately predict your tortuosity for any given porosity electro. What we can also do this is we can now ascribe for any given shape of a starting material, we can predict the end tortuosity of our battery. And um, this is what's known as a Zing diagram. It's a way of representing shape um, in two uh, dimensions. And in these diagrams, a sphere is located at this uh, point in the diagram. You have disks over here and rods up here. And general ellipses are in the center. And so in standard battery manufacturing, we said anisotropic particles align a parallel to the current collector. And so this means that your Brueggemann exponents will range from 0.5 with a sphere. And as you go more and more anisotropic, um, your tortuosities will only increase with this increasing alpha. However, you can significantly decrease tortuosity if you start aligning your materials perpendicular um, to the current collector. And you see this here, where we now predict in the case where we could align the materials in this direction, we can get a decrease um, in tortuosity from 0.5 as the sphere to much, much lower by using anisotropic particles. So there actually is an incredible benefit to anisotropic particles in the future. Not only is graphite naturally anisotropic and currently um, the cost of battery manufacturing is substantially increased by trying to make graphite spherical. They, the industry typically wastes now about 80% of graphite by trying to make it round through milling processes. Um, so these sorts of ways of thinking about how to align materials, how to start manufacturing batteries in new ways can um, lead to extreme benefits. Um, this is especially key as we start looking at electric vehicle applications or grid stabilization applications. In these applications, you need um, to have lower tortuosities so you can obtain thicker electrodes. So we want to make our anode and cathodes as thick as possible so they contain as much active material as possible. Um, this leads not only to increased energy densities in your battery but also decreased battery cost because you now have a higher fraction of active components versus inactive components in your cells. And so what uh, we show here is simulations for graphite. So currently what we know for graphite materials is that the, for the commercial cells we've investigated, um, as well as the ones we make in our lab, the Brueggemann coefficient is typically ranges between 2 and 10. So we're moving uh, with increasing alpha in this direction. Now, if we can start decreasing alpha by aligning materials in a different way, um, what you can see is you can start getting substantial uh, gains in your rate performance. And what this, what this alternatively transfers to is for a given rate, cap uh, rate performance that you want from your battery, you can increase your electrode loading. Okay? And this is electrode loading is basically just electrode thickness. So um, with that, um, hopefully I've convinced you that there are a lot of exciting things that need to be explored in the material space. 
and that there are a variety of optical and electronic techniques that are out there that have often been already applied in other systems but haven't been applied to a lot of these new um, energy related um, material sets. So thank you for your attention. I'm happy to take questions. Yeah, I mean, I, I think a lot of people look at transient absorption spectroscopies to understand some of these processes as well. So that could be uh, a technique you could apply, certainly. Um. I have a question about the uh, uh, electrodes for lithium ion batteries. Have you looked at uh, uh, carbon nanotubes uh, with a lot of interest in using those for high performance electrodes? Uh, how do they fit in your scheme of things here? Yeah, I, I guess so there the question is often um, how much, so carbon nanotubes are really attractive for capacitors because they often, it's like a surface um, um, storage of lithium. Um, I think um, certainly uh, there's a lot of interest in aligning, um, you know, materials. Uh, so maybe some of the techniques that are known uh, for vertical alignment and orientation of of nanotubes could be potentially leveraged for graphite, but graphite is probably more of an interesting material for batteries, whereas capa uh, capacitors, carbon nanotubes are, are potentially more relevant. Um, what we have done in the solar cell field is shown extremely high by using, um, we have a recent paper where we look at uh, carbon nanotubes um, scaffolds as um, photo anodes and that we can increase the diffusion lengths of um, so how fast can we extract charge and we can decrease recombination uh, with the electrolyte and disensitized solar cells by using a carbon nanode vertically aligned scaffold. So there's certainly ways of playing with anisotropy and materials um, to, um, to improve a lot of performances, uh, electronic and ionic. Uh, about the quantum dot like it has a band structure mm -hmm. but is that a good way to understand these quantum dot solids because the hopping between them is not band like it's mm -hmm. just hopping well that's kind of uh, one thing that's uh, very different depending on how you treat the surface of your quantum dot so certainly um, in a lot of cadmium selenide systems where you have either very long insulating ligands or thick shells people have reported more hopping-like transport. But in these lead sulfide-based systems, um, people have been also reporting band-like transport. So I think one thing that, uh, when we start applying these models, one thing that was, um, of course, a, in, very critical for us was, you know, the data is the data, right? So you can apply a capacitive or transient-based technique and you get data. And then you have to apply some assumptions to uh, interpret this data in terms of getting it to uh, a defect, uh, to getting a defect state <coughs> as a function of energy out. And um, so what is actually really, uh, what we liked was actually that with these th different techniques, which are inherently different, one's capacitive, one's transient, one's small signal, one's large signal, um, you assume different semiconductor models, we actually get the same data out, which actually suggests that these materials can in a way be treated as band trans, highly defect filled uh, band transport uh, materials. And my sort of related question mm -hmm. was, in the quantum dot emission, you said the solution seems to be to go to a localized emitter like manganese in a quantum dot. But if you're doing that, why wouldn't you just use a small molecule like the AMOLED people do to use, like, like these iridium complexes mm -hmm. in, in organic, active matrix organic LEDs where all the action takes place at a molecule, mm -hmm. isn't it the same thing, having manganese level in a quantum dot, isn't it like having, having a molecule? It's very similar. I mean, the idea is simply that potentially there you could uh, you could leverage benefits of quantum dots. Um, I mean, 
typically, I mean, you can often they're more uh, resilient to solution-based processing than organics. Could be one justification. Uh, another um, could be air stability. So um, often um, there have been reports of you know quantum dot LEDs where you don't have packaging. They're processed often. Um, you can do a slightly higher temperature processing uh, most times than with organics. Um, but it's I mean it is leveraging a lot of the ideas and concepts of single molecule design to a slightly larger uh, material set. Um, you can also play in that sense with um, not only the quantum confinement due to the localized emission, but also of the nanocrystal. And so both play a role. So like these manganese uh, impurity dopants, you can change the line width of your emission by changing um, the, basically the, the amount of quantum confinement to extent. So there are some cool effects that you can see. So you change a bit of your, you know, the exact um, point of your emission and the coupling, so you change the line width a bit. So there are still side effects of that. Yeah, exactly, yeah. <laughs> so these sorts of things could be exciting for with quantum dots. Yeah. Are you done? So I was curious, you talked about for gluttony and how it could be advantageous um, if you can improve that and control it, uh, make larger molecules. And I was curious if you thought about that for conversion materials, whereas we saw you have this really dramatic volume expansion. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I think um, you can start thinking about um, architectures for batteries um, with conversion materials that would be more favorable and also moving away from traditional designs. Um, yeah, I mean, that could be one thing is you can start thinking about using, um, I mean, one idea would be if you can understand, um, I mean, you could have different things like um, highly anisotropic materials um, and you could if you could figure out along which um, crystalline directions they lithiate, for example, you could start synthesizing materials specifically to that and then arrange them in your battery um, so that you have the, the fastest lithiation direction or the minimal expansion direction in the correct orientation. So there are lots of things you can learn from these, these sorts of techniques. But of course, yeah, there's a lot you could do with conversion materials also in terms of optimizing microstructure. Yeah, so we do work on this. So this, um, the work I showed here today is using um, the Tomcat beamline at the Swiss Light Source. So um, uh, there, the resolution is um, effective resolution is about 400 nanometers by 400 nanometers, um, 400 nanometers. Um, you can see uh, lithium dendrite formation. So we have done work on this. So we had a, a recent beam time doing this. Um, so that's very exciting. Um, we also have a whole project devoted to uh, FIB tomography, uh, which brings you down kind of to a more nanometer size scale, and so that uh, we've also developed techniques for imaging um, various uh, lithi uh, lithium uh, dendrites and so forth in and uh, using that technique as well. Can you see lithium uh, Yeah, you can see you it. Can yeah, yeah, we see it quite well. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's actually a, a very nice material to study with x-ray or um, SEM-based techniques. So the different colors, the red and the green, you mean? Okay. Um, yes, yeah, so I think that's one of the was the major cha one of the major challenges, and I think um, one of the issues in designing 
uh, quantum dots that still hasn't been achieved is understanding of the thermal stability. So the th um, it's not necessarily a thermal degradation process, simply a thermal reversibility. So it's known that as the quantum dots heat up, they lose quantum efficiency. And of course, this is becomes a major challenge in a lighting application where you have you know, a, a high intensity uh, gallium nitride source. So um, that's actually the reason why um, you saw in both technologies that have been commercialized, the quantum dots are not placed directly on the blue uh, LEDs like phosphors are. So there's always a large spatial separation between the quantum dots and the, um, and the lighting source, the blue light source. And this allows basically the thermal effects that would cause shifts in your color due to different decreases in your, um, your quantum yield as a function of temperature to be minimized because you simply just space, space the emitters away from the heat source. Um, well, I mean, the color stability of the end light, white light will be because if you're red and green, um, if the thermal, if the efficiency falls differently with temperature, then you'll have different uh, color white light as a function of temperature. Um, 